Welcome to the Friday edition of the MD Edge Daily News. I'm your host, Nick Andrews. And I'm MD Edge editor Terry Rudd. Today, why spontaneous intracranial hypotension may be misnamed, but you should still know it. Also today, prolonged antimalarial therapy is linked to cardiomyopathy risk. And later, breast arterial calcification and low bone mass might be red flags for coronary artery disease. But we begin today with new evidence to support managing cardiovascular risk in patients with type 2 diabetes. This is according to two new studies published earlier this week in the New England Journal of Medicine. One study examined weight gain after smoking cessation. That study showed that despite a temporary increase in type 2 diabetes risk, weight gain didn't diminish the long-term benefits of reduced cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. The data suggests that weight gain after quitting smoking didn't undermine the benefits of reduced cardiovascular mortality or extended longevity. The researchers say that preventing excessive weight gain may maximize cessation's health benefits by reducing the short-term risk of diabetes. The second study examined five risk factors in more than 270,000 patients with type 2 diabetes in Sweden. Those risk factors are elevated glycated hemoglobin level, elevated low-density lipoprotein cholesterol level, albuminuria, smoking, and elevated blood pressure. The researchers then evaluated patients' risk of all-cause mortality, myocardial infarction, stroke, and hospitalization for heart failure. For patients whose five risk factors remained within target ranges, their risks of the four adverse outcomes nearly matched or were lower than the risks among more than 1.3 million control participants. The investigators say the findings indicate that having all five risk factor variables within target ranges could, in theory, eliminate type 2 patients' excess risk of acute myocardial infarction. For more details on these two studies, click on the link in the podcast description. Spontaneous intracranial hypotension could not have a more misleading moniker. But doctors faced with tough headache cases also need to be aware of the misleading belief that it's a rare condition. Dr. Deborah Friedman is the chief of the Division of Headache Medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Speaking at the annual meeting of the American Headache Society, Dr. Friedman said that SIH is not always spontaneous. The main problem isn't intracranial, and cerebrospinal fluid pressure is usually normal in these patients. SIH's misleading nature spills into its incidence rate. It's labeled as a rare disorder, with a published annual incidence of 5 per 100,000. But Dr. Friedman says that's a gross underestimate that stems from the lack of an ICD-9 or ICD-10 code for the condition. Because SIH is a tough diagnosis, doctors need to be detectives. Consider the diagnosis in a patient with a new daily persistent headache or in the patient running around with a diagnosis of chronic migraine for which nothing works. The questions to ask center around whether postural, end of the day, and Valsalva components to the headache are present. If so, think SIH. Risk factors that are a tip-off include joint hypermobility, previous lumbar puncture, epidural or spinal anesthesia, known disc disease, or a personal or family history of retinal detachment at a young age. Patients with lupus erythematosus who are taking antimalarials could be at risk for cardiomyopathy, but measuring specific myocardial biomarkers could help identify patients who are at particularly high risk. This is according to new research published in the Journal of Rheumatology. The study included 151 consecutive patients with lupus who had no prior cardiac disease. During the study, 28 patients had been taking chloroquine, while 137 patients had been taking hydrochloroquine. Overall, 16 patients had abnormal brain natriuretic peptide, or BMP. Of these patients, 9 also had abnormal cardiac troponin I. Prolonged use of antimalarials was associated with an increased risk for these elevated biomarkers, regardless of age and of disease duration. Dr. Constantino Salios is a researcher at the University of Toronto Lupus Clinic. Dr. Salios says that he and his colleagues showed that chronic antimalarial use 
is associated with a more than three-fold increased risk for elevated creatine phosphokinase. He also notes that cardiac biomarkers could become a screening test for patients with lupus who are using antimalarials for longer than five years, or who have persistently elevated creatine phosphokinase levels. And finally today, breast arterial calcification and low bone mass were both strongly linked to coronary artery disease risk in asymptomatic women. That's according to a study published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, Cardiovascular Imaging. In the study, researchers evaluated 2,100 asymptomatic women who were at least 40 years old, all of whom underwent a self-referred health evaluation that included a DEXA scan, coronary CT angiography, and digital mammography. 199 patients had breast arterial calcification, or BAC, and 716 patients had low bone mass. BAC score was significantly associated with coronary artery calcification and coronary artery plaque. Low bone mass also had a positive link with coronary artery calcification that grew with severity. Yan Yi Yoon is a researcher at Seoul National University in South Korea. Dr. Yoon says the results suggest that breast arterial calcification, which is easily visible on every mammogram, provides an independent and incremental predictive value over conventional coronary artery disease risk factors. And that concludes this edition of the MD Edge Daily News. Links to these stories can be found in the podcast description. For MD Edge, I'm Terry Rudd. And I'm Nick Andrews. The MD Edge CardioCast is all new today with top stories for the clinical cardiologist by Dr. Jim Dwyer. You can subscribe to the CardioCast, the SiteCast, and all of our podcasts on Spotify, Amazon Alexa, and Apple and Google Podcasts.